my pamphlet last night and it said this is what my talk was about, so I fixed the slide so it said that at the top. <laughs> <clears throat> so something you need to understand about me, I started as a science fiction novelist. That's, you know, science fiction. Um, so I'm with the vaporized platform. Uh, I started working for this, um, which is an interesting platform to work for. I published a bunch of books. Um, some terribly, terribly important books like Galveston, which won the World Fantasy Award, and Yoda, Dark Rendezvous, <laughs> which did not. <laughs> um, but in 2001, I was uh, bitten by a radioactive Spielberg. Um, they were making a movie called AI, and a group at Microsoft wanted to make a strange, crazy interactive product, and so they they wanted a very sort of impressive science fiction writer to be the lead writer of that, and so they came and asked. And he said, no, but I have a broke friend. <laughs> uh, and, and I jumped into the breach and was the lead writer on the first of what is now called an alternate reality game. Um, alternate reality games are giant Dickens novels that play out using every kind of media. So, to give you a very fast idea of how you would get into this sort of thing. That was the poster for the film. If you looked really hard on the poster, if you saw it in life or online, you'd notice a couple of odd things. For instance, in the credit block, there was a credit for Janine Sala, who is the sentient machine therapist. And you, if you thought to yourself, what is a sentient machine therapist? And you went and you entered in an Alta Vista, <laughs> because it was 2001. You would find uh, the web page of Janine Sala, who was the sentient machine therapist who also had a practice at Bangalore World University's campus in New York in the year 2142. And from there, there were links to many other pages and people who also lived in the world of 2142 and also had, for instance, phone numbers, like the one you might find if you noticed that there were tiny little ticks in the words summer 2001, and if you wrote out all the numbers of ticks, it was a 10-digit number, and what the hell, you could try calling it, and oh my god, you'd be talking to someone who also lived in 2142. So you would follow that uh, those trails into a story which then led to websites for corporations and individuals who were having bad marriages and there was a serial killer who was murdering sentient houses. Uh, it's science fiction, right? If I tell you that there was a killer geisha robot, you are not surprised. Um, one of the things that's interesting about the internet as a kind of a printing press is the internet doesn't care much about how the media is made. We tend to think about um, art as a series of nouns that are defined by their production process. A book is made of paper and is distributed and you buy it like shoes. A movie is another kind of product which you buy and you play in a machine. Um, the internet doesn't care about that stuff. It'll do a website, it'll do text, it'll do video, what do you want? Doesn't matter. Um, what's important is you are the story of the vec to which everything vectors. Um, we were asked to talk about it, uh, me and a, the designer on it, Ilan Lee, were asked to go to Intel and talk about it, and they were saying, so what is the most interesting thing about this project? And what we ended up saying is the most interesting thing about this project is the audience. Most things we make when we grew up were singular activities. Um, I read a book. I watched television, maybe I sat in a theater with a bunch of other people, but each of us had an individual experience of a movie and then we went home. The audience for the game thing story we had just made wasn't like that. It was distributed all over the world um, and it was participatory. They investigated clues, they went to physical places, they called phone numbers, they found bits of the story, and then they talked to one another about it. Um, Susan and I have worked together with a guy named Joe D'Annunzio who had a lovely coin for this called Search Operas uh, because the basic thing is I look stuff up and then I gossip about it, which sort of life now, right? Um, so we said, okay, what makes this interesting is the audience and um, it made me think about science fiction but what I somewhat flippantly said to the Intel people is that what I mean by that in this case is that we've recreated 19th century science as an entertainment. 
uh, uh, modality. So in the age of Darwin, right, the way that science worked is a guy would say, hey, I found a funny looking tortoise here in Guyana. And the next guy would say, I'm in France and I did an experiment on oxygen. And the next guy would say, I found the bones of what seems to be some prehistoric thing um, on my visit to the Americas. And then they would write all this stuff up and they would send it into the philosophical transactions. And that was the way science progressed. It was a worldwide collaboration of amateurs who were pooling their information and resources. Let me say that slightly differently. We're live tweeting the Oscars, <laughs> right? We have entered the age in which we are all living life and culture the way that Darwin and his buddies lived science. So art, instead of being a noun, is in this sense also a verb. First, there's content. There's the story. I made that bit. That's the book or the movie or whatever. Um, but then there's the experience of collecting or engaging with that art. And then there's the community that I share that experience with. And those two other things are really important. Um, I mentioned earlier the best thing that ever happened to me when I wrote a book is I won something called the World Fantasy Award. And 11 months later, they sent me a little thing. For each of the big ARG experiences, I got invited to someone's wedding. Because during the course of the game, people met were passionately engaged, fell in love, and it was so important to them that they wanted the guys who had made the game to be there at their wedding. I have never yet had someone, oh my God, that's not true. I did get a wedding invite for Yoda Dark Rendezvous. <laughs> Story for another time, very fast segue. When a girl says, he told me the story of the extended Star Wars universe for six hours, and right then I knew he was the one, <laughs> dude, never let her go. <laughs> there are not two of that woman. <laughs> All right, so let me give you an example of the kind of art you can make. And I say this as a novelist, like I'm able to, I read Henry James for fun. That's how old school I am. But there are things that you can do inside this. Oh, as a graphic artist, I'm a pretty good speller, but you're... <laughs> um, here's something you can do that you cannot do in a novel in the same way. Susan Bonds and I worked on a project called Last Call Poker. And there was a character that you might interact with named Lucky. And uh, Lucky was the patriarch of a family, and he was trying to make sure everything worked out well, and he was also dead. So, you spend a lot of time talking to ghosts. Um, one of the things that Lucky would do if you needed a little help is he'd ask for a favor from you, and these things were called small favors. And an example of one of the favors he would ask is he'd say, I want you to go to a cemetery somewhere near you live, and I want you to find the grave of someone who died on the day you were born. And just do something nice. Clean it up write a poem, take a picture, leave a gift, whatever you choose to do, that's okay, and then just tell me about it. Many people wrote in to say that was the most profound artistic experience they had had in their lives. Um, I was doing a little research uh, preparing for this talk, and I found someone who wrote two years ago about the fact that he and his daughter went out to do this together, and it's still an experience that resonates for the two of them that they talk about to this day. It is profoundly personal because the audience is bringing their whole selves into it. And yet it's inside a construction. I mean, you know, I was writing the character of Lucky and all that sort of thing. It's this merge, a, a collaboration between the initiating artist and the audience who are also participating artists in their own right. That leads to some interesting questions about where art is centered. And a lot of people, Robert got to everything all of us are going to say. Um, but, <clears throat> and it was awesome. Um, in a sense, we were kind of vaporized, but we remain as sort of dust trails. Um, one of the things that happens is there is a different ownership over art now. Um, I gave a, a keynote a few years ago to a thing called Power of the Pixel, which I, my title was The Tyrant in Winter which is, how can I pretend to share power with the audience while retaining as much as I humanly can? 
because I grew up writing novels and I like being the boss. <laughs> But the fact is, we are not the controllers in the way we used to be. Here is uh, here are a couple of examples. Who owns Harry Potter? Okay, legal answer: J.K. Rowling owns Harry Potter. Other legal answer: Warner Brothers owns Harry Potter. Other legal answer: a bunch of lawyers who will sue your ass.、Um, but in metaphorical terms, in the first five novels, you can see that there was a lot of work that J.K. Rowling put in. There's 717,000 words over those first five books. Okay, here's fanfiction.net. That's one website yesterday. There are three quarters of a million complete stories set in the Harry Potter web universe on that one website. Among those stories, for instance, are the editions of Hermione, Queen of Witches, which are all seven novels rewritten from Hermione's point of view. That counts as seven of those three quarters of a million. Not only has J.K. Rowling written. Uh, less than one percent of all the Harry Potter material that has ever been written. J.K. Rowling has written less than fifty percent of all the Harry Potter material that's ever been read. She is important. She's primus inter pares, because it's academic, so we lose Latin. <laughs>、um, but she does not own it in the way that we used to own things as artists. This is a dance.、Um, I'm going to do something slightly more Nebraska-themed. Are you ready for some football? <laughs> Last year, the total revenues of the NFL were 13 billion dollars. That's advertising revenue, jersey sales, ticket sales, the whole shebang. Did I mention live tweeting the Oscars? So years and years ago, a bunch of people made up a game called rotisserie baseball, where you would、um, pick. Players, and then you'd see how they did over the season. Then you compare your list of players against other people's players. Well, this has picked up and become very prevalent. Till now, we have, for instance, fantasy football. How many people here have ever participated in a fantasy league? Right, there are a few of you.、Uh, last year, the revenues of this game that the audience made up about football were 15 billion dollars. The audience game. About the thing is worth more money than the thing. <laughs> Welcome to the world we now live in. Sure, wish I could remember what my next slide is. Oh, hey, that's easy. So、uh, we're getting to the point of where storytelling is going and what the Carson Center can do. So this spring, I released an interactive comic book game platform thing on the App Store, where. Just to add my version to Robert's number,、um, we got picked as、uh, like games we love, and I was really excited. And I wrote back and I said, "So, how many games came out this week to be on the list?" And they said,、uh, "This week we released 4,000." <laughs> There are 4,000 games released on the App Store that week. So I thought, "Okay, I'm super pumped now." <laughs> so I was going to put this game out, but I needed some help, and I needed that help to be really smart and really now and fairly inexpensive. Student. And I asked myself, "Okay, what am I going to need from that person?" Right?、Um, and I ended up hiring Althea. And I'm going to tell you about Althea because Althea is one version of what you might want to be producing here. So, content. Remember that content experience community. So, content. Well, Althea shoots and edits film. She's a USC graduate. So, thank you, Norm. <laughs> Uh, she can work in Final Cut, or she can fool around in Maya. She can make like movie stuff, and you need that because when you put stuff up on the App Store, you have to have a little video of what happens in your gameplay, as well as if you're making promotional material, right? She can make graphics in Photoshop and a whole in Design and a whole bunch of other things, so that you can get help making promotional material. Because this is my graphic skill, so <laughs> you don't let a commercial product have that, right?、Um, She can write and she can edit. She also has a three and a half octave singing range, but I haven't found a way to make that part of the gig yet. Okay, the consumer experience. She also has game design background and some UX/UI design background, so she understands how it is that people want to maneuver through a website or through an experience. And if I say, "Hey, can you fix up the website?" She's very good HTML and Java. She has a little bit of Ruby script, a little bit of Python script. Um, so she can actually make those adjustments. 
I'm a 51-year-old who reads Henry James for fun, so I'm not going to be writing the Python scripts. Um, <laughs> community, she's a native user of the social media stuff that I don't always quite, uh, I can't tell you about my Instagram, and otherwise I'm fairly quiet. Um, she's a native user of those forms, and she also knows a little bit her way around the APIs for how to embed stuff in Facebook, um, and then we've gone together on the journey of learning, you know, the, the advertising tie-ins for that sort of thing. And she is a fan herself, and this matters because um, just as all those people are making Harry Potter fanfics, J.K. Rowling has to understand something about those people and treat them with some respect. You need people in your organ. As you seed power, you have to treat those people nice. So, just as an a brief experiment. In the room, how many people have heard of Sherlock Holmes? Mm, pretty unanimous, right? Okay, how many people can do some degree of digital editing? You can make movies, like it's a film school, so good, right? Photoshop, that kind of thing, yeah? Okay, um, how many people have game design experience? Fewer, but some, like maybe a dozen. Um, Scripting, I don't really care what, write a little code of some kind. So more than the gamers, maybe twice as many as the gamers. Um, and then how many are fairly active social media users? That's really interesting. Okay, last question, and anyone who raised their hand every other time and can answer this question, if you're looking for a job, come see me. <laughs> how many people know, here know what John Locke slash fic is? Okay. I'm not going to tell anyone, but you ask them and they'll explain it. <laughs> what it. The reason it helps in this age of the world, or just to actually get to a funny end of the slide because, oh my God, I'm between you people and coffee. Um, <laughs> we, the Star Wars Rogue One came out. Um, that was a big thing with the fan communities in science fiction that I'm one of, and we wanted to do a little something, and we had this game coming out. And here's the sort of thing that a person like Althea can do in 10 minutes that I couldn't do in the rest of my life. Because did I mention I wrote Yoda, Dark Rendezvous? And see, like, uh, from my selfish opinion, this is what I want the Carson Center to produce, like that, that, many, many times. I'm going to stop and let you guys eat pastries. <laughs>